Good morning. I'm Susan Somerville, and I'm the president of Mount Sinai Beth Israel. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room as I've been getting around the hospital and the organization and meeting with you. So the purpose of this morning's meeting, and I am joined by Dean Charney and by our president and CEO of the Mount Sinai Health System, Dr. Ken Davis. But we're here this morning to really talk about Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And there are certain things that I'd like to discuss with you, and then we are very interested in hearing questions or concerns that you want to bring forward to us. And this is a first type of meeting focusing specifically on the needs and what's going on at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, and it is the beginning of what I will consider to be a series of meetings, and we'll talk about that because I think it's a point in time for our hospital and for the broader organization that communication is extraordinarily important. So I want us to be having discussion. So first of all, we are about six months, six months formally in to our new organization. There's a lot of controversy about the language of what happened. And you will find, as you get to know me, that I am very straightforward. I'll put things in front of you that I think you're thinking. So merger, takeover, people debate this language. So here's what I'm saying to you. We are all part of a new organization. Mount Sinai Hospital is, Beth Israel Hospital is, and all the other entities in our organization are changed. And we are part of a new organization. And it brings great benefit to us. We now have an extraordinarily large footprint, both in facilities, hospitals, ambulatory sites, and the size of our physician network. That positions us for what's happening in healthcare. The days of small, freestanding entities, with the way that we are being paid, the way we will be paid, the way we will be judged, and the way that we are able to take care of patients differently really require that we have an extensive operation in order to do it. And we do, as a result of the Mount Sinai Health System. Here at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, we also have a medical school, one of the top 20 medical schools in the United States. That is a big deal. We also have a different focus on certain aspects of our hospital. <coughs> Dr. Charney has been astoundingly focused on our nursing school and what it means to our organization to have that asset, which is a wonderful thing for us and for our nursing staff and for the future nurses who will graduate from what is now a baccalaureate preparation program. Anybody ever shop at Costco, BJ's, Costco? I still call it Price Club. I haven't gotten over the branding of it. Um, you know why the prices are good there? Bulk. Because they purchase as a huge organization. And you, as an individual, purchase more stuff. Actually, it's a little ridiculous when you go in there how much you buy that you don't need. But you do better from a pricing standpoint because you're so large. and they're coordinated in a way that they can purchase at a different level. So are we. And that keeps our expense base down. It allows us to invest in programs and people and processes and ways of taking care of patients. So we're part of an organization that's a very different place than it was seven months ago. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here. Because when I heard about what the plans were for Beth Israel, now Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And I spent an hour and 15 minutes with Dr. Davis. I wasn't looking for a job. His office called me. I came into the city. I wasn't nervous because I wasn't looking for a job. Figured it was a conversation I'd explore. And within an hour and 15 minutes of hearing the plans for this hospital in this organization, I made a decision to come here. So let me share with you what I've seen. I have seen pride of ownership. 
and warmth in the staff of the hospital. People are very proud of Mount Sinai Beth Israel. I've seen it in trustees. I've seen it in people who clean the floors. I've met with the supervisors during the last 24 hours, which just an amazing wealth of knowledge and information in the team. There is a pride in this hospital that is really quite astounding. Because sometimes you go to hospitals and people just kind of come and go. It's a stopping point. Maybe they take a job because it builds their career portfolio. But it's not a place that they truly love and consider themselves to be a part of. That's what I feel here at the hospital. We know we want to build surgical services and centers of excellence and programs. We want to build upon the programs we have in the hospital. I'm looking at Susan sitting in the second row. We have a world-renowned neurology program. We need the counterpart of neurosurgery, don't we? It's yin and yang. And we're building it as we speak. We are making investments in bringing in medical leadership to complement the medical leadership we have today. We are looking at programs that are bursting at the seams at Mount Sinai, where you can't fit another patient into the building. We want those programs here, not as outposts, but as centers of excellence. And we're in downtown New York. I hope I don't get in trouble, which is the cool part of New York. <laughs> it's a growing part of this island. It touches other regions because of its location. So we want to really envision the future of what Mount Sinai Beth Israel Hospital is. And that's what we're going to do. Now before I go to your questions, there's one other thing I want to say. A lot of things are changing outside. We have to adjust and change inside. Part of that refreshing of the hospital, by the way, means that we're going to reorganize the hospital. If you ever look at how it's organized right now, it's irrational. <laughs> Nobody planned for it to be that way. It's just that, you know, you have an eight patient service and a 16 patient service and you put them on a floor and one of them grows and then you have an outfield and if you look at the way it's organized, it doesn't match our patients today. So we're going to look at that as part of our refresh. So I always like to put some good stuff with some challenging stuff. We're going to refresh the hospital. You may end up being on a different floor as a result of that with the patients that you're used to taking care of. But that's part of how we rationalize the way the hospital works. So everyone gets an assignment whenever I speak to a group. And I always pick on people in the back row if no one asks questions. That's a trade secret you now have. Everybody back there is good. They're like, is Wes the back row? Um, no. So. <clears throat> The other way we're going to change the hospital we're starting to do today, and it doesn't cost any money, not a cent, and it's our future. Every single person who touches directly or indirectly one of our patients changes the way they experience care. We provide excellent clinical care and we will continue to strive to improve it every single day. The 10 seconds before a patient undergoes anesthesia, that last 10 seconds, they cling onto consciousness. Anyone who's had anesthesia knows what I'm talking about. How does it feel if someone in the room has their hand on your arm as you go to sleep? You will remember that forever. What does it cost as a staff member to take that 10 seconds out of what you're doing for that patient? <clears throat> Nothing but it irrevocably changes how they feel about our hospital. So starting today, that's our job. Every single person, doesn't matter what kind of day you're having, every single person. And that's my assignment. So I'm gonna stop talking. Was there anything that needs to be covered? Okay. Um, questions for us, questions for me about the hospital, questions about the organization. We have microphones that we will bring to you and I know you have questions because people have been asking me questions individually and I think it's important that we start to hear collectively what some of those issues are and what some of the answers are. Okay? Oh, hi. Uh, will there be any efforts to 
to market um, the individual hospitals? That's a great question. Um, we are deeply engaged uh, with uh, advertising firms now to talk about our strategy. Um, so yes, there will be a very robust marketing campaign. Um, the reason we haven't done it to this point um, is a multiple. Uh, but uh, some of the reasons that you know I'd like to you know express is at this point we don't even have adequate signage on all these hospitals. Um, I don't want to go out with a big advertising campaign when we don't have anything really to back it up. So we need to have a sense of more stability in the whole system as we go forward. Now, the question about individual hospitals causes me to raise this aside. Everybody looks at advertising campaigns and they're waiting for the big ad of the New York Times or they're waiting for the, you know, the, something to be on TV. In fact, what modern marketers will tell you is that the place to put your money is on the internet. It's in developing websites, it's getting high up on search engines, it's in social media. And we have a tremendous amount of resources there and we'll spend a great deal of money there. So if you don't see it on the radio, TV, or in the New York Times, it isn't because we're not really focused on spending a lot of money on it, we're just doing it in a much more modern way. Let's get you a mic. <coughs> what are your plans for uh, psychiatry, if any? So we have a very large behavioral health footprint within our organization, 150 beds actually, so it's very large. And like every other program and part of the organization, we are starting to assess from top to bottom how we're doing. One of my major focuses in every program is what is the continuity of care that we provide to patients, both before they ever come into the hospital, while they're in the hospital, and when they leave the hospital. And that is really very much based on how we're going to be paid as an organization, and frankly, where medicine is going. The days of taking care of people that are sick is not our future. The days of taking care of people, their health, their wellness, acute illness when we have to, but keeping them healthier, and by the way, putting some responsibility on patients and all of us to be thinking about those things. I'm not going there today, but we're going to talk about that in the future. We really need to understand all of that, and part of the assessment of behavioral health will be each step of that process. We have to understand when we discharge patients, whether it's behavioral health, or any other service in the hospital, what are we discharging them to? So that is an assessment that is happening across the hospital. The one thing I will tell you is as we move forward and start to make decisions, you will hear from me what those decisions are. It's very early in the game, but I don't want you hearing it on the street, I want you to hear it from me. So. Uh just to add, as many of you may know, Ken and I are both psychiatrists. So uh, we are very committed to behavioral health. And as Susan mentioned, uh, we're developing centers of excellence throughout the system. And behavioral health is going to be a center of excellence, uh, both here at BI as well as at Mount Sinai Hospital and uh, St. Luke's. So we're in the process, and, and uh, individuals here at BI are very much involved. Uh, in this process, we're looking at what should be located where. Uh, the premise is out excellence, no matter where it is. What should be the inpatient footprint? What should be outpatient? What should be devoted toward prevention, which is actually uh, the, the most important aspect of behavioral health care? So the message today is really it's a high priority. Uh, excellence is the premise, and you'll you'll be involved in as we develop the strategic plan. So. Um this is an area that is going to be changing rapidly, and it's out of our control. Um, the state, in the next few years, is putting together managed care plans that are going to enter almost all the psychiatry patients in managed care. The desire 
is, as Susan alluded to, to decrease readmissions and to enhance ambulatory programs. Now, those of us who've been in psychiatry a long time have watched repeatedly as our patients have been disenfranchised um, for programs that were supposed to exist in the community and never did. So one of the things we're gonna have to do is be vocal voices, strong supporters of what we know is right and that will be resources in the ambulatory area when our state and lots of other states really don't have the resources. So we have to be very, very careful. That said, when managed care enters the picture, they're going to make sure that there are fewer admissions. What will be inevitable is that the bed footprint will shrink. Um, so there are nearly 500 beds across the Mount Sinai Health System in behavioral health. And uh, it is highly unlikely that as we look backwards from 2017, that there'll be 500 beds again, because the state's gonna make sure that that isn't the case. They simply can't afford it. There's an opportunity for us here, though. And the opportunity is in shared savings and population health, because if we are on the cutting edge of being able to decrease inpatient utilization and keep our patients well and really develop excellent programs, it's likely that there will be shared savings and resources that could come back to us. So we're gonna be on the cutting edge of what goes on in behavioral health. I'm confident that we can do this together. Um, the BI Psychiatry Service has a long and great tradition in providing excellent care. This has always been a great psychiatry service. Mount Sinai's has been too. Um, I think together we can be on the cutting edge of this, particularly with leaders in the Mount Sinai Health System who are psychiatrists. But we're all gonna have to be cautious and to end where I began to recognize that it won't be business as usual. Things will change and we're gonna have to accept those changes. Uh, I'd like to take it a little bit in another direction, please. We have always been proud of our graduate medical education program here at BI. Many of uh, the physicians on staff today trained here. Uh, they did their internships here, they did their residencies, and they stayed. Um, it's, a, it's a big program, and now it's a huge program. Would you comment, please, on how you see our role in that? I don't know if Michael Lightman is here. <coughs> He's, he's the, the head of the, um, the program here for GME, and he, have, uh, he and I have been uh, meeting, and he's going to have a leadership role throughout the system. And so we highly value his input and his expertise in terms of uh, GME. Uh, we've begun to look at the training programs here, and there are many outstanding programs. Uh, you know, I looked at how we did in the match at BI, at St. Luke's, at Roosevelt, at, uh, at Mount Sinai. And many programs said did, did very well. Uh, it's our intention to do even better, to go from a very strong baseline in terms of the graduate medical education program and work together to attract even better uh, candidates uh, for the training programs. So uh, it's a highly valued aspect of the system, the GME program here, and we're going to work together to make it even better. I can't give you the exact number of residencies. I can tell you we have about 2,000 house staff in, in the system, which makes us perhaps the largest uh, GME program in the United States. So with that comes a lot of opportunity to share experiences because when you look at all the hospitals that are now part of the system, we'll have the opportunity to provide our trainees literally every kind of experience, uh, treating every different uh, kind of patient from all different cultures and ethnic groups, there's almost no disease that we don't treat in our system. So it should be a rising tide that lifts all boats in that the training programs across the system should improve together. Um, I'm gonna ask you to do something too that Susan asked, and that is to be very sensitized to the issue of graduate medical education and its reimbursement. Um, in the president's budget, there were major cuts for GME and IME reimbursement. Um, our senator, Senator Schumer, 
has been at the forefront of reversing those cuts. Uh, Harry Reid also is opposed to those cuts. So those cuts were dead in arrival. But they come back again and again and again. Here's what's frightening. Very shortly, the Institute of Medicine will publish a report that says graduate medical education is overfunded. And that's going to stand out to everybody in the House and Senate who wants to cut the budget in a way that will make it very hard for us to maintain this level of funding. I can tell you this level of funding for a 2,000 resident program is essential to the well-being of our facilities. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do is watch this carefully, get mobilized, and be prepared to write letters and to make telephone calls and to talk about how critical GME and IME funding is to the health of New York State and to New York City and to these institutions because it's the fight of next year and it'll be critical. So I just, I just want to add one thing that Dr. Davis is not going to mention, um, that we gained as an organization in becoming part of the Mount Sinai Health System. We gained one of the fiercest, most vocal advocates for health care issues that I've ever met in my life. At a local level, at a regional level, at a state level, and at a national level, Dr. Davis has an extraordinary passion, drive, and voice in influencing the direction of health care and issues like the one that he just raised. We are blessed to have that because we want the right people who are knowledgeable pushing that agenda. And if he gives us an assignment to follow through on it, we are all going to do it because numbers matter in how these things get backed. So that's something we will continue to discuss, and I really do thank you because that advocacy, you want the right people who get it fighting those battles. Very important. Hi. I, this is along the same lines. I wanted to know how the health care reform has changed the way we do business at Mount Sinai BI, and how do you see, think this will impact us in the future? because we've already been having issues with right. the exchange, insurances, and being paid much less. Right. Um, <coughs> so we could spend a half hour on that. We could spend the rest of the night, but we won't. Um, the top line is that the health system over the next 10 years will have $2.1 billion less reimbursement that is a consequence of not just the Affordable Care Act, but also other changes in regulations and reimbursement that have been promulgated through the Center for Medicare Services. Um, so that's a big challenge to us. Let's step back and understand what that means, $2.1 billion. So it's about $200 million a year have come out of our hospitals. Um, if you back out the medical school's top line revenues, what's left behind for the hospitals in the health system now is a little over five billion dollars. So 200 million is four percent that has been taken out of our margin by changes in health care reimbursement that stem from the ACA and other related activities. Four percent margin is a larger margin than any of our hospitals have had in well more than a decade. So to begin with that change is business. What do we also know about what's going on? We know that there isn't a person you can talk to at CMS or in the economics of health care who doesn't say that fee-for-service medicine is a dinosaur. And that was part of the reason that we all came together in integrated health care system, to be prepared for population management, to be prepared to share savings, and to be prepared to take risk. And that changes everything. But to give you an idea of how it changes everything, in the fee-for-service system, the most important sources and foci of margin to run the hospital were the surgeons doing complex surgeries. Because we would get the greatest reimbursement for the most complex patients. In a shared savings or in a risk model, Every time someone goes to surgery, it's taking money away from the premium that you've collected 
that if you don't use falls to your bottom line. So suddenly the most important people become the primary care physician and gatekeepers who are keeping everybody well, who are keeping you out of the ORs. So there's an utterly different orientation as to what our priorities are and where we put our efforts and how we conduct our business. So we're going to see enormous changes over the next few years. The good news is that a large integrated healthcare system is the only way that you can really survive in what's going to be this new environment. Um, Mount Sinai as a standalone hospital, a niche specialty hospital on the Upper East Side, it wasn't going to make it in the long run. It may have been fine for 10 or 20 years, but in the long run, that's not the future. Just like in the long run, a great hospital like this one with this tradition wasn't going to make it alone. We all have to come together for what the new world of healthcare is about. And just, just to bring that down to where we are today, because this is a sea change. This is not tinkering around the edges. This is a complete rethinking of our future. And people sometimes say to me, how do you plan and manage a hospital today understanding what's in front of you? Number one, by becoming <laughs> part of something larger that has the ability through scale and scope to manage everything that the population needs. Today, when you leave here and go back to your jobs, I look at it as pretty straightforward. We have to be the highest quality most efficient and best feeling hospital that we possibly, possibly can be. And in the future, we have to be exactly the same because those basic components will help us care for patients in a way that they get what they need, when they need it, where they need it, and they feel good about it. So that's how we have to focus our efforts as we ride through this white water that we're in, and it's permanent. <laughs> Susan said it brilliantly. When we talk about value, the way to think about value is quality over quantity. So you do it very well, and you do a lot of it. How can you do that best in a large system? Consolidating services and making sure that we can do things at the lowest cost for the greatest value, for the greatest outcome. Lowest cost, greatest outcome. We can do that. So as an aside, what we should think about is, so how do we make sure that patients want to come to this hospital because we know we can provide good quality and we know we can probably provide it at a cost-efficient basis, but how do we get people to come? And I want to return to what I think Susan said so brilliantly, which was, you know that 10 seconds where that patient goes into anesthesia and you put your hand on them? Or to make sure that everybody makes eye contact and says hello? What people need to remember most about Beth Israel as they leave it is, boy, they cared about me here. Boy, this is a warm, nice, caring, sensitive place. Because if the only thing we think that will turn that around is new bricks and mortar, if we started today, if we even knew what we wanted in that hospital, which we don't, because healthcare is changing so rapidly, but if and if we did, between raising the money, getting the architect's designs, building it, doing all the relocations, it'd be six, seven years before we had all that done. What happens in the meantime? What happens in the meantime is people have to want to come here because they say, this is a warm place. These are good people. They really care about me. Okay, let them build a new Tisch Hospital. It's got to be irrelevant to us. It's got to be irrelevant. What matters is what's inside, how we care. And we got to show that. We got to know that because they're building a new Tisch Hospital, we got to go out of our way to show people how much we care, how kind we are, how sensitive we are. And we go the extra mile for everybody. Susan said it great. You know, it's symbolic. If you touch people for 10 seconds before surgery, 
it'll make a big difference. But you know what else matters? When you are a nurse and you're a doctor and when you go to the bedside, you don't stand up over patients and talk down to them. You sit down at their bedside and you meet them in the eye. And when you're even you're a housekeeper, at the end of the day you say, is there anything else I left out? And you're not afraid even to our patients to share something about yourself, to be really human. Oh, my kids, oh, they're impossible. You know, it just makes you real. And to say, this is a warm place. That's what we've got to win. Um, can you fill us in on what investments and improvements you are planning the, for the next two years? So I think the most important investment that we're looking at is what I just spoke to you about, which was is really going through the hospital and doing what I call a refresh. Um, when I look at the, um, there are too many emails in this organization. Does anyone agree with me? <laughs> All right. Whoever figures that out. Come and talk to me. You're going to be very popular. Um, but when I read the emails of the tracers that we're doing in preparation for joint commission, and when I walk around the hospital, which many of you know I do, um, I think I was scaring people on Tuesday evening. I was walking through Fearman Hall, starting on the top, and you know, people just kind of shut down. They were shocked. I said, "Got to get to know Fearman, right?" Um, there are very basic maintenance things that we have to do to make the hospital look better. It will still be an old hospital. Um, I am looking to figure out how to get the pneumatic tube working so people don't have to bring stuff places that the stuff gets moved without people. And as soon as people leave a floor and go somewhere, I don't know, they may stop at the side of the hall and, you know, talk to one of their friends for five minutes run that across thousands of people every single day, every single month, every single year. You want to talk about efficiency? Those are people who can be taking care of patients. So it really, in my mind, is the very basic infrastructure and refresh of the hospital. Um, many of us have lived in old houses. They're not perfect, right, at all. But if, if they have a fresh coat of paint and we take care of the basic maintenance, they're fine. And, and as Dr. Davis said, we need a baseline that we, our patients deserve that, and the hospital needs it, and you deserve that for your work environment. But beyond that, we can knock any other hospital off the playing field if patients experience the type of care that we can provide them. And by the way, we either make or lose millions of dollars a year based on patient experience scores, now there's money attached to it, and every bit of money that we bring into the organization allows us to invest in the future, and that's really the way that it works. But you know what the biggest investment is going to be? It's going to be in people. It's going to be in bringing in a lot of physicians. And maybe Dennis wants to comment about that. We're in recruitment mode, and uh, the school is working hand in glove with with Susan and uh, other leaders here to uh, bring on uh, new, new faculty, physicians in almost every area, whether it's thoracic surgery, in uh, the brain sciences, in general surgery, uh, across the, the specialties in medicine. Uh, we know we got to increase volume coming into the ambulatory clinics and the hospital here. And, and so we're working together in terms of the school and Beth Israel to essentially rebuild a lot of the services here so the volume goes up. And so every, we're meeting every week, and m mainly what we talk about is what kind of recruitments can the school help BI with to get top people to come on one hand. And also we talk a lot about what's the morale like here at BI um, w with the physicians, uh, what's important to them. And so we're working together on getting the word out, hearing uh, what concerns people might have to make sure that our best doctors, our best staff are committed to BI, want to stay at BI, and work with us as we, as we grow uh, together and compete with the other top hospitals in the, uh, in the region. I, I should add one thing from my own personal experience. I spent 23 years at Yale, 
and there are two major hospitals in New Haven. There's Yale New Haven Hospital and there's the Hospital of St. Raphael's. And patients like to go to Hospital of St. Raphael's more than Yale New Haven Hospital. And the major reason was that the environment at St. Raphael's, uh, from every staff person to the nurses to the physicians, was much warmer. You know, the quality of care was equal, but the environment in which the care was given was much better at, uh, at St. Raphael's. And maybe Yale learned something because they took over St. Raphael's. So now <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's one integrated uh, system. So I also want to emphasize the importance of having high morale and letting that be transmitted to your patients so they know this is the place to come. The reason for us talking to you today is for you to be able to start to see where we're going. And we want all of the talent in this organization to stay right where it is. You mentioned, uh, well, it's been mentioned about, you know, not being an isolated hospital and that change is coming through the organization. During this transition period, um, how are you going to ensure that the mission and the vision um, remains consistent um, within the framework itself? So I, I hope we've touched on some of those points this morning. The mission of the hospital doesn't change. The way we fulfill that mission and the way we operate the hospital, there will be changes. And I'll give you an example as a cardiac. Are you a nurse? No, I'm a fellowship coordinator. Okay. So, so we had our first meeting, one of my first big town hall meetings here with the cardiologists. When I was first working in cardiovascular care, um, open heart surgery patients were in the hospital for six weeks. They were in an intensive care unit for a week, intubated, sedated, not moving. And by the way, I don't really remember a lot of nutrition being, being involved, okay? Um, today they're in the hospital and uncomplicated bypass patients in the hospital for about four and a half, five days. We provide much better care. We didn't know that back then. We thought we were providing state-of-the-art care, and actually at that point in time we were. We are going to change the way we do things because the world around us is changing. The technology is changing. The ability to care for patients in their home is changing. There are many things that will be different. And the most important thing to me is that we maintain the mission, but we have to maintain the bottom line in order to maintain the mission, because we've seen some very bad stories about places that didn't figure that out, haven't we? We're not going to be one of those places. And it requires senior leadership, understanding the mission and the vision, but then it has to transcend all the way through the organization so everyone is supporting it. And that is the plan. Did I answer your question? Okay. Other questions this morning? You're welcome. Thank you. I want to add a thanks. I want to thank Susan for coming here. She is an extraordinary person. We are very, very fortunate that she's here. And to speak a little bit about leadership, I want everybody to understand that when she speaks, she speaks for me. She is totally empowered by me and Dennis. When you speak to Susan, you're speaking to all of us. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I am actually one of the resident representatives here, um, part of the House Staff Council for two years. I'm part of the psychiatry department. My name is Olga Libu. Um, and one of the questions that I have, and I brought up with you um, at the former town hall meetings, is sort of, as we all know, we are sort of trying to get a union here. Um, and what's sort of been in the way? Um, and why have we been referred to as students and not employees? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your question in a specific fashion and then we can talk about it offline. Um, in my past life, and I've run a hospital before, one of the things that was very important to me because it helped me understand the hospital at a different level, and ev every group you speak to in the hospital has a different vantage point, um, has always been to meet with the house staff and the residents, fellows, about um, the hospital to talk about the future of the hospital and also to hear how you see the hospital and what are things I need to know to make it better. 
Um, and that's not something new for me. I've done, usually I do um, lunches or breakfasts quarterly, sometimes with the program director, sometimes without. I actually had the opportunity to meet with the incoming uh, chief residents for surgery several weeks ago with Dr. Lightman because he sent out an email with their pictures announcing them. And I thought, I, I got to meet this crowd. And it was, um, it was a very good meeting for me, and I think it was a good meeting for them. So what I would say to you is, if you are interested in discussing issues in the hospital, please come and speak to me. I am very open to having that discussion, as I am with every other group in the hospital. I think that openness brings information to me that helps me decide and prioritize the things that I need to do in the hospital and for the people who work here. What I would add is, you know, no matter what the outcome is of whether the residents uh, unionize here or not, and you know, that's a long debate of what's best okay. for training and so forth, uh, we're still going to be committed to training you and uh, for you to become the best physicians that you possibly can. I think we have time for one more question. I, I just want to know what's happening with nursing. I can't. Nursing. nursing. What, what are your plans for nursing? What are your plans for nursing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm starting to meet with groups of nurses, and I, as I said, I had the opportunity to meet with the nursing supervisors yesterday evening and this morning. Um, I believe I'm the first nurse to have run this organization. And for those of you who have seen my business card, the only initials that are on it, and I have other advanced degrees, are RN, because that's the core of who I am. So I am an extremely strong advocate of nursing, because nurses, and our colleagues who are PCAs have more contact with our patients than anyone else in the hospital. You are at the bedside. So that's kind of a broad statement, my plan for nursing. Um, what would I love to see in our future? I would love to see us get magnet status because it speaks to a level of professionalism and commitment and I've found that it means a great deal to the nursing staff, and it helps us recruit nurses, and it helps us retain nurses. And those are things that are very important. Everyone's a change agent that I've ever met in my life. I love change. Change is great. I embrace change. Change is awesome, except for one kind of change, the change that affects them directly. They're all about change going to everybody else. Um, I see a wonderful nursing staff in this organization, and it's extraordinarily encouraging to me, and you should know that. And we will build on that. There is no substitute for excellent nurses within a healthcare organization. There really isn't. It's a huge foundation to how patients experience care. So don't worry, all right? And we'll keep talking. And tell your colleagues, don't worry. We are going to move forward in a very positive direction. In fact, you know what? I would say based on the discussion that we just had over the last hour, I can absolutely feel that happening. Can you feel it happening? So we're good. All right. Thank you so much.